Hi, everybody. Welcome to Woodland and Wildlife Wednesday, the first webinar of 2022. How exciting. I see that it's uh, 12.01 right now. I thank you for joining us on time. I think I'm gonna get us started. I'm seeing some familiar names in the, in the, in the uh, joining us. So hi. <laughs> um, yeah, let's get right to it. Um, I'm excited to be hosting the Woodland and Wildlife Wednesdays. Uh, my name's Agnes Kedmanitz and um, with me is Taylor Robinson, also with University of Maryland Extension on the forestry team. And uh, a colleague of mine, Luke McCulley, he's the wildlife end of things. I'm the woodland end of things. And then my colleague, Luke, he's the wild wildlife end of things. He's going to be joining in and doing some hosting this year too. So you won't get sick of my face like you did last year if you joined us for any of them last year. All right. So again, welcome to Woodland Wildlife Wednesdays. Woodland and Wildlife Wednesdays, welcome to the first uh, Woodland and Wildlife Wednesday webinar for 2022. Um, if my slides would like to advance, then um, we'll be that much more ahead. So today's webinar, what, what can we do for bees? So Lindsay Barianko, if you remember her from last year, she also spoke last year about the cicadas. Remember last year when we had the cicadas, Lindsay talked with us last year. So Lindsay Bar Bar Barianko is joining us again this year, and uh, she's with the University of Maryland College Park entomology graduate student who joined the Van, Engel Van Engelsdorp Bee Lab in 2018. Uh, Prior to joining the Bee Lab, Lindsay worked with the Maryland Department of Agriculture as a regional apiary investigator, helping beekeepers with honeybee pest disease and disease problems. Her current research involves uh, ground nesting bee preferences within varied soil substrates with a particular interest in wildflower meadows. One of her uh, recent projects involved planting eight wildflower meadows throughout the state of Maryland with public partners and private, private partners and volunteers. So she's gonna to talk to us about bees. Bees are essential for the, for the pollination of our fruit and vegetable crops and for the pollination of wild plants. Of the 20,000 or more bee species worldwide, we have about 430 species in our area of Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, DC. Let's learn more about these amazing insects, the challenges they face, and what we can do for the bees. So welcome. Few housekeeping items before we get Lindsay to start her presentation. The webinar is being recorded, so by you remaining on uh, uh, on the program here, you're giving us permission uh, that you're okay with it being recorded. And as you can see, uh, your video is off and you're muted. So hopefully you feel comfortable with that. It's being recorded so that other people, or if you want to watch it again, you can watch it at extension.umd.edu/woodland. So one of the benefits, if you remember from last year of uh, registering for the webinar is the free quarterly uh, newsletter with notices of upcoming events and webinars. And if you would like to opt out, of course you can and just put a no events when you get that email from Pam Thomas. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please send them our way. The chat box at the bottom of your screen is the way to type that in. We appreciate that. And um, we'll reserve questions for the end. So Lindsay will do her presentation and then her and I will kind of have a little bit of a conversation uh, involving your questions. Next month's webinar is Endangered and Threatened Species of Maryland, How You Can Help. Um, this is a great one with um, Cherry Keller. Um, and she's gonna be talking to us about endangered and threatened species of Maryland. That's next month, February's Woodland and Wildlife Wednesdays. That's gonna be a good one. Look at how cute those animals are. Can you believe it? they're threatened? So cute. Okay, so today's webinar, without further ado, um, might I introduce uh, Lindsay and get her to uh, start her program. So thank you, Lindsay, for joining. Thank you, Agnes. I'm really happy to be here and nice to see you again since the periodical cicada talk back last May. 
Um, and thank you too for advancing the slides. I'm gonna keep my video off. You saw me in the hat, that's what I look like. Um, but um, uh, we'll go through and hopefully you can hear me okay. Agnes, is my voice coming through all right? Loud and clear, Lindsay, very great, great. thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm happy to be here uh, to talk about what we can do for bees. Sometimes I talk to groups about what bees do for us and there will be a little of, of that, but not much. Mostly it's what we can do for bees as ordinary people out in the world, living in places, having yards, what can we do for bees, both in terms of large scale land management and small scale landscaping practices. And I'll mention pollinators sort of interchangeably from bees, but sometimes they include butterflies and flies and moths as well. But primarily I'll be speaking about bees. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, I'm, I'm trying. Oh, sure, yep. yep. Um, just give me a second. Uh, not sure why, there we go. Oh, thanks Agnes. So as Agnes mentioned, I joined the Van Engelsdorp Bee Lab back in 2018 at the University of Maryland College Park. We're a large lab um, composed of many people. Uh, Dennis is in the upper left and um, Karen Rennick, who also runs the lab is in the upper right. And then it's comprised of graduate students um, and a postdoctoral student, um, lab staff, and others. The focus of the honeybee lab is on honeybee health and takes an epidemiological perspective in terms of the prevalence and distribution and possible treatment of honeybee disease. Um, and it's also a lab that's involved with the Bee Informed Partnership, partnership which is a group of um, universities and other groups that uh, track and keep data on colony losses and management um, troubles uh, and issues of, and data actually, of large scale bee, beekeepers and small scale beekeepers alike. And then there are a few in the lab that study native bees. Um, I'm one, and then my fellow graduate student, Lisa Cooter, who I wanted to give a shout out to and thank for some of her contributions of slides to this presentation. So it's a good group and we have a lot of fun, but the upshot is we're all very passionate about bees. Next slide, please. Yep, just give me one second here while it decides when it wants to advance. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure why we're having, um, there used to be something there. Okay, so as Agnes mentioned, thank you. I um, am coming to this as a really a third career. Um, I had a career in law and mediation for many years. Um, but I became very interested in agriculture and honeybees as a beekeeper. I had a backyard honey business, which led me to work as a regional apiary inspector for the Department of Agriculture in Southern Maryland. Uh, and that led me to study at the Bee Lab at College Park. And I've had some previous projects doing some wild bee surveying in Maryland and Delaware sand mines in prior years, abandoned sand mines uh, for wild bees. And also we took on as a lab meadow planting projects with eight Maryland uh, partners. Some are solar partners, um, some are private partners, some are public partners. And that occurred over the past three years. And I'll share some slides about some of that work in our, our planting um, endeavors. But I'm uh, looking at ground nesting solitary bee preference uh, right now. And I also like to do a little bit of bee photography. This is kind of a dark image, but I love capturing bees that are resting at night. So that's that bumblebee that's kind of dangling under that blossom there. Next slide, please. Yep, thanks for that pointer. <laughs> so bees are just one of many insect pollinators. From the bottom right, we have um, andrenid bees that emerge in um, early spring. And the bottom center, we, had a surf, we have a surfeit fly, looks a lot like a bee, um, but it's not, that's a fly, has two wings and very large eyes. That's the way you can tell bees have four wings. Um, the swallowtail butterfly, and then upper left, we have the um, clear wing moth, also a pollinator. To the upper center, a wasp, but 
Bees, as you can see, upper right, and this is an image from the US Geological Survey Flickr account, you can see that they are just covered in pollen. They are the most efficient pollinators and particularly wild bees that forage earlier in the morning, later in the day, in, in cloudy weather, bad weather. Uh, they're out there doing that pollination work, allowing plants to reproduce and many of our native species plants to reproduce in our area. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to take in, if we could, this very small bee, these are very common bees, sweat bees they're called um, in the family Helictidae, but just the beauty of this bee, I find astonishing to look at. It's just, it's teeny and many bees are no bigger than a pinhead. We think of big bees like bumblebees and carpenter bees and honeybees often, but many of them are these teeny bees that really are under the radar, but have these gorgeous metallic exoskeletons, some green, some kind of bluish purplish. And you see the pollen that just um, is taken up all over the body on these bristly hairs that they have, allowing them to be the most efficient of pollinators. Next slide, please, Agnes. And not only on the outside, the inside is incredible. I have to say, you know, when I look at a teeny bee that's no bigger than a pinhead, I often think of the internal structures from the brain to the nerve cord, to the heart, to the digestive system, the reproductive system. It's just, there's so much going on in there. And we really don't think about that when we look at these tiny insects, how much there is going on on the inside, very complex physiological processes. And I just wanted to draw attention to that because they're really quite incredible, uh, both on the outside and the inside. Next slide, please. So a little bit about managed bees. I'm not gonna talk about larger social colonies, but they play an important role in our agricultural system, pollinating the bulk of the fruits and vegetables that we currently eat. Up on the upper left, we have a queen honeybee who's marked yellow so the beekeeper can see that queen, surrounded by workers that care for her. And housing in this instance are, is provided by hives. Commercial beekeepers load these bees on tractor trailers, take them out to um, California for the February pollination event on almond crops, and then up to Washington state for apples, and also pollinating the Eastern seaboard from Maine with blueberries to Florida with citrus and everywhere in between with uh, squash and pumpkin, for instance. But we're not gonna be talking about large uh, social colonies today primarily. We're gonna be talking more about wild bees, but these bees, managed bees, provide um, a lot of our fruits and vegetables. The bee on the right is a alfalfa leaf cutter bee, also managed. Uh, this was an introduced bee from Europe in the 1930s that pollinates alfalfa crop for seed production. And this is the alfalfa hay that is fed to dairy cattle, a high protein hay. And those dairy cattle provide um, many of our dairy products like milk and cheese and yogurt and so forth. Next slide, please. So managed bees um, are face challenges as do wild bees. Some of them are in common, but some are a little bit, um, are, are shared actually. So the, the, the problems that impact managed bees, like the honeybee, for instance, are known as the four Ps. They have parasites that they have to contend with. This varroa mite image that you see is a mite that attaches itself to the honeybee and it vectors uh, viruses, many different viruses and weakens the colony overall. There are pathogens that these bees contend with, both viruses and bacterial disease. Pesticides impact honeybees as well as other bees, homeowner and agricultural use. And also primarily, and this is the crossover with wild bees, poor nutrition, just lack of flowers. That's the way they are able to function by uh, accessing nectar and pollen. And with urbanization and monoculture agriculture, there um, and land fragmentation, there's just a lack of uh, floral resources. All of these impact uh, sort of working together impacts both managed bees and to some extent, particularly with the flowers, wild bees. Next slide, please. So there was a study done uh, by researcher in the UK uh, back in 2015 that addressed these bee declines um, amongst all bees in these interacting stressors 
coming from uh, limited floral resources, combination of parasites and pathogens, and then uh, in this instance, some um, uh, pesticides such as neonicotinoids that are taken up through the plant roots and expressed in the pollen and nectar, also interacting with fungicide applications and making those pesticides that much more toxic to bees. All of these interactions working together, which drive bee declines. Next slide, please. So I wanted to show this just to give everybody this uh, uh, idea of all of the diversity in wild bees. And sometimes I'll refer to them as wild bees or native bees, bees in our area that, that are not honeybees or, or bumblebees for the most part. Just great variation in size. Some are hairless, some are very fuzzy. The coloration is incredible, the metallic uh, coloration just gives you a sense of the great diversity in species. And as uh, Agnes mentioned in the beginning, there are over 20,000 bee species worldwide, 4,000 in North America alone, over 4,000, and more than 430,000, or excuse me, more, more than 430 in our area of. DC and Maryland and Washington and uh, Virginia. Next slide, please. So you may wonder, well, what are wild bee researchers looking at? They're looking at a host of things. Uh, their research has been going on for some time now. People have studied native bees for a while. It's not as funded and well-known as uh, honeybee research for sure, but, but researchers are looking at native bees in crop pollination, fruits, berries, ag system hedgerows. The, they, look, they look at the distance that they're able to forage. Many of these wild bees don't fly very long distances like honeybees that can fly for three or four miles to access floral resources. They're looking at plant resources for bee, individual bee species, life cycles, exposure to pesticides, different bee communities in different areas like green roof plantings or urban areas, nesting behavior, native bee diversity and abundance and conservation, and sometimes the impact of non-native bee species on native species. So there are a variety of, of research going on worldwide. Um, and I think native bees in terms of popular literature is something that people are reading about, more aware of. I'd say within the past five to eight years, it seems like that people are reading more and thinking more about wild bees and their needs. Next slide, please. So what do bees need? Well, they certainly need food in the form of flowers, uh, nectar and pollen. Uh, nectar is that carbohydrate. Pollen is what bees, solitary bees, uh, will feed their young. And most of these wild bees are solitary bees. About 70% or more nest within the ground, solitary female making that nest. The other 30% or so are nesting in cavities like hollow stems or crevices somewhere. They need shelter. So unlike the managed colonies, hive material isn't provided um, as we saw with the alfalfa leaf cutter or the honeybee. So they're needing to find shelter in either those crevices, but primarily the ground. They need access to water. And importantly too is mobility, the ability to fly from their nesting site to their food source um, is, is of huge importance, particularly because as I mentioned, so many have these very short flight ranges, um, sometimes only a couple hundred yards as compared to the miles that honeybees can fly to access floral resources. Next slide, please. So there are over 430 wild bee species in our region. And these are bees like mining bees on this upper left or sweat bees on the lower left uh, in the area of Virginia, Maryland and Washington, DC. Next slide, please. So the life cycle of these bees, of a solitary bee, the bulk of these ground nesters is that they emerge in the spring, early summer as adults, the females and the males will mate. Um, then the female will go off and she'll find a conducive nesting site. And that has to be accessible soil, soil that she can burrow down into, um, sometimes sandy soil so she can make her way down a, a tunnel and build a little chamber, which you, then looks like it's glistening there. You can see that she secretes uh, from glands this material that coats the chamber and it has uh, antimicrobial properties. And she plops down there a 
mixture of pollen and nectar in that ball where they'll, she'll then lay an egg on top and that egg is not in the eating phase. It will just lay there for perhaps a few days or so until it becomes larva, which is the grub eating stage where that grub will eat that pollen nectar ball until it pupates, where it becomes immobilized and then its body reforms and all those internal organs take shape in the exterior components, the wings, antennas, and mouth parts take shape. And there it will sit as a pupa for maybe eight or nine months underground until it emerges once again when the weather warms and the soil warms and the flowers are blossoming and it can forage on the flower that it forages on again as an adult and it starts that cycle all over again. So you can see how important ground is to these um, wild ground nesting bees. Next slide, please. And this is a nice um, illustration that I just love because it gives you a sense of you know, how intricate these um, nests can be and how much space they can take up. Sometimes it's just a single tunnel going down with a couple of chambers off to the side, but oftentimes there are many different um, tunnels with separate chambers and they're, they're reminiscent almost of plant roots, aren't they, the way they look. Um, it's, it, it, and so you can see there's a lot going on underneath the ground too, which makes ground essential for these bees. Next slide, please. So land management in large scale ways is very important for bees, it's key, and they offer great potential. And by this land management, I'm talking about huge tracts like roadsides, public lands, solar facilities, parks, anywhere where we have large um, areas of land that can be managed in particular ways. Next slide. And I realize that we're not all land managers, um, but we you know, might volunteer at a park. Uh, we might write our representatives about you know, how land might be used. So there are different ways for us to be involved. For instance, we have in the United States over 17 million acres of roadside land uh, that could conceivably be planted for pollinators and bees. That's a lot of land that we can plant in ways that, that is somewhat other than turf grass, which is what you see a lot when you drive down any road, is turf grass and then it's mowed repeatedly throughout the season. So great use of uh, land for bees. Next slide, please. And we see that the, the resources are all there. So there's ground there for bees to conceivably nest in. They could be planted with wildflowers um, and seeded in that way and managed in that way, less cutting. Uh, once a year cutting as opposed to like uh, every couple weeks or so cutting of grass. And we see off to the left, uh, this image up above taken from the air of land developments and how these roads kind of, which are represented by those yellow dots kind of snake around developments. And oftentimes these roads have greenery flanking each side so they're typically trees or grass or something that's green there that's planted for bees, which offers great opportunity um, for pollinators. Next slide, please. These wildflowers that we'll be talking a lot about today are also terrific. You see all the flowers of different shapes and sizes um, and colors up above attractive to bees. And you see, but too, the extensive root system um, that they have that can absorb water runoff, for instance. You compare that to this little oval circle on the left that's circling turf grass. Up top, it's short, it's cut. There typically isn't much there for a bee to access in terms of food or even nesting. It has short little roots, so it's not going to absorb much water, leading to a lot of runoff. Um, but that Cold, cool season turf grass that we have that's mowed repeatedly is kind of like a thick mat for a bee. It's something that's not readily accessible for nesting. So you see with these other plantings, there are little areas in between that bees can get in and there certainly is much more for them to eat with these wildflower uh, plantings. Next slide, please. So we see these wildflower areas can support complex food webs even beyond bees. So um, to extend to other insects and other organisms. So we see this inner circle of 10 to 30 plant species of the echinacea, looks like some goldenrod there. We see the leaves of the pollen and nectar and the seeds from those plants, this 10 to 30 species, 
then feed the grasshoppers, the bees, the butterflies, which then on the outer circle feeds birds and spiders, other, another layer of predators. So it's a very complex food web that all starts with these plant species. Next slide, please. So if we get back to roadsides and look at Maryland specifically, we have about 50,000 acres of roadsides that could conceivably be planted for pollinators and bees. Next slide, please. And it could look like something like this. This was taken by a fellow who does a lot of landscape work in the Philadelphia area, Larry Weiner, um, and he plants vast meadow areas. This is what it could look like along a roadside. I do sometimes see um, naturalized, wildly grown areas with native plantings, um, but more often I'm seeing just grass. And I bet that you probably see that too. But roadsides could look something like this or even like the next slide. Next slide, please. Or something like this, really beautiful to look at as you're driving along and there's a lot there for bees and other pollinators. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide from uh, Lisa Cooter, my fellow graduate student who has a project um, involving meadows on roadsides. And you can see too, the abundant wildlife that's there from turtles to moths and grasshoppers, beetles, birds nests, there's just so much that could be found in there and, and so much habitat available if we were to keep these roadsides and plant them in, in a more naturalized way. Next slide, please. So we did as part of the Bee Lab um, become involved in a, what we called a pollinator meadow initiative. And this was a, a, a project that started three years ago where we helped establish and manage eight meadows with public, private and solar farm partners over a three year period. We identified some challenges in terms of the equipment, the preparation of those sites, the maintenance of those sites. The goal was to build partnerships with landowners to encourage future native wildflower plantings, to increase nectar and pollen for bees and other pollinators, to establish demonstration meadows for teaching purposes for master gardeners, mas master naturalists and other groups, uh, community groups, volunteer groups, other organizations, and just to enhance the community. So I want to share some of those photos um, from those places. Next slide, please. We started off um, finding these partners and speaking with them about sites that we could seed with these wildflower areas, both big and small, an acre uh, was the largest and then small was much less than an acre. But we used a variety of um, 26, a seed mix with 26 different native plant species, the partridge pea, the purple cone flower, warm season bunch grasses like little blue stem, uh, various species of goldenrod. And the beauty of all these meadows is that there's always something in bloom between these 26 uh, species within the mix that's coming up from early spring to late fall, everything in between, and that also changes from year to year. Uh, these meadows from seed can take a little while to establish um, three to five years until maturity, but it's very interesting to see um, each one change as the years progress. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the places we planted was a solar facility, not this one on the upper left. I just wanted to include this image to show how vast these areas can be and how much grass they typically cover. And it seems to me um, the whole idea behind renewable energy and solar facilities is to change um, our dependence on fossil fuels to try to eliminate that. And wouldn't it be great to plant around these sites so that we're not depending on every two week grass cutting in between those panels and around all of those panels. So the lower right is the site that we um, planted the meadow in uh, not in between the panels, but at the very end along an acre up in Frederick County. And this is a site that's mown every two weeks, but wouldn't it be great if we can get more wildflower areas planted within these locations? Next slide, please. I lost my little icon at the oh, bottom. Oh, you lost it. It's oh, there it is. Okay, oh, thanks, thanks, thanks Agnes. Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> so it could look something like this. And wouldn't that be beautiful if we could use all of that land, eliminate that, that mowing uh, during the summer season and the spring and fall too, 
and just have these beautiful wildflowers there. That would be terrific. Um, so this gives you a sense of what's going on in, in some locations, uh, particularly in the UK and in Minnesota, they have many of these plantings. Um, next slide, please. And this just gives you a sense that this is the first season up in Frederick County um, for our meadow area. And we're getting some blossoms. In the beginning, it can be a little rough looking. You're wondering if these seeds are gonna take hold, but they usually do. Um, and this will be much easier to, to contend with needing only an annual mow in the future, um, which will be very nice. Next slide, please. This is another site um, on the University of Maryland golf course in College Park. This is an out of play area. This sort of soil area is our prepped area where it was seeded in the fall. I think it was November when we got to this, but it's amongst a huge swath near the entryway where they're typically just long, long grassy patch, not necessarily planted in anything, but we wanted to do a part of it in wildflowers. And so we did, uh, this was actually the first meadow that we planted, meadow spot. Next slide, please. And this is what it looked like um, the second year. This is Rudbeckia, which uh, came up in the second year in a big way. But the interesting thing about this meadow is it doesn't look like this all the time. It's different in the spring than it is midsummer, and, and then it is in the fall. And then every year brings something different. So it's very interesting to go back and see um, all of the different uh, wildflower species coming up and all of the insect activity. There is a huge difference between the long grassy area, just observationally, um, looking at the long grass area and in, in compared to the, um, the wildflower area, just a lot more pollinator activity in the floral area. Next slide, please. This is another site uh, um, in a partnership with the city of New Carrollton. Um, in Prince George's County. So they, um, at their city hall, they take great pride in their floral plantings at city hall and other areas around um, the, the, the city. Um, but in this site, they wanted to transition from the annual plants that they were ripping out with each season and every year and uh, get into planting native shrubs and native plant perennials uh, species. And so they wanted toward the back a wildflower area, which we did. Next slide, please. And it looks something like this. So instead of ripping out those annuals each year, they have perennial shrubs, perennials, and that wildflower patch is toward the back, that fuzzy yellow, longer growing patch. We thought it would be better back there um, since it tends to get a little um, taller than the rest of the plantings. But that's another site that's doing well too. Smaller scale, but um, planted just with wildflowers back in that area from seed. Next slide, please. This is another site I really enjoy. Um, the nice enjoyable thing about this is that the community has really embraced this meadow site. This is University Park, a little park called Wells Run along Adel Adelphi Road. Um, and it used to be sort of a scruffy lot, not used for much, just grass, and it was mown by the city every week or so. But they wanted to put in a meadow after they were doing sort of some um, underground pipe work, which they did. We seeded it with the 26 species uh, seed mix that I mentioned. They put in a little uh, a mulched pathway and set up some benches, and they have community events there. They had Meadow Day last year where um, we set up tents and people came out and they had a little uh, scavenger hunt for children. And they have a group of volunteers that manage the meadow. They get together a few times a year and they take out invasive weeds. And it's just so much easier to, to deal with in terms of the maintenance. Um, it does need some tending to in, in terms of looking at weeds and getting those invasives out of there. But the cutting here occurs uh, once a year at this point. And this is another place where you just, you know, anecdotally you go up and you can see just such a difference between looking at insect and pollinator activity in the grass versus the meadow. It, um, you just can't compare them. It's just, there's so much um, activity in terms of pollinators in this site. And they also have some nice signage that they did about the plantings themselves and, and the bees within that uh, meadow. Next slide, please. So, uh, this isn't one of our plantings, but this is um, one of uh, uh, the, the 
plant, uh, meadows uh, planted by Larry Wiener, the landscape fellow I mentioned earlier. And this is a vast property. Most of us don't have that much property, but the thing that interests me about this um, image is the proportions between the turf grass and the wildflower plantings. So most of the time you do see the opposite of this, which is a lot of mown turf grass and maybe a little border area around the perimeter or somewhere on the property of plantings. But this is just the opposite. This still has lawn, so you know kids can run around on it or you can drag a chair out there and sit in the sun if you want to, but it's not so big. Um, it's still there, but it's, it's, it's not so overwhelming. And the bulk of this property is planted in wildflowers and shrubs and amongst mature trees too. That's what I think is so beautiful about this picture. Next slide, please. This gives you another sense of what it could look like out front. Usually we see lawn again. This is another alternative to that, a, a sown wildflower meadow, really beautiful. It takes a little bit of time to establish, but in the end, you're really um, curtailing that weekly mowing. Next slide, please. So what could we do in terms of small scale landscaping practices um, in our own lawns? I mean, really we can, if you can stick a couple of pots with plants out there, that's great for bees. But if you have a lawn, you might think about limiting its size, um, mowing infrequently, moving away from exotic plant species that might have been bred so they know it no longer has pollen or nectar that's accessible for um, some of the indigenous uh, wild bee species in our area. Might rethink mulched hardwood beds. Some of that hardwood mulch is very hard for bees to penetrate. Um, increasing native locally adapted flowers, the wildflowers that I mentioned, and using softer leaf mulch, something that bees can get through, and perhaps keeping some bare ground here and there. Next slide, please. So landscaping practices that we might think about minimizing include um, automatic waterers. I still see some in my areas amongst businesses. Um, if I go into um, the town area, they pop up and it could be right after there's been a, um, a rainfall and we are getting a lot of rain these days in our area. So, you know, these bees are in the ground making their nests. This is just more water to saturate, conceivably saturate those nests. We might want to rethink those automatic waterers. Hardwood mulch, as I mentioned, is like cement to a small bee, very hard to penetrate. And then of course, landscape fabric, it has its uses for us. Um, it certainly has its uses in preparing meadows. It can kill off grass for sure. Um, and it can help with deter weeds from popping up in this image that we see, but it's very difficult for a ground bee to penetrate and make its nest. Just one more sub ground substrate that isn't available to a bee. Next slide, please. So we might also wanna think uh, about some of our pruning practices. Many of the bees that I mentioned, that 30%, uh, nest in these hollow pithy stems like uh, raspberry canes or uh, 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 woody stems like that, like osmia bees, small carpenter bees. So when we're pruning, we might wanna leave uh, at least a foot of a stub there in case they're nesting in there, but we also might wanna take that pile of cuttings and kind of, clump them all together and put them off to the side of the yard, giving whatever bee might be nesting inside that cut portion a chance to emerge. Next slide, please. These are other substrates, uh, ground substrates that are attractive to bees. Um, we might not think on the right, upper right-hand side that that looks really attractive, but I know that I've had places, I've lived in houses before where part of the yard looks like that. <laughs> So that might bother us, but that might be a great site for bees. And I've often seen solitary bees nesting together. The aggregations of females find that very attractive. They can get down in there and, and have a communal kind of um, area where they each have their individual nests, but they're, they're all there together. So leaving those areas as bare spots can be great for bees. And also the rocky area on the left-hand side putting down rocks, just having sort of a border there between the turf grass and the driveway and, and having some space in between, particularly with some sandier soil. That's a very attractive um, nesting area for some bees. Next slide, please. 
Also old snags and stumps down trees, you know, they may have beetle holes. These are also going to be attractive cavities for bees to get into and um, nest within. So it, it's a great idea just to leave these if you have wooded areas um, surrounding your property, just leave down trees. Something will make a nest in there. Next slide, please. When thinking of particular plants too, I know I've mentioned these wildflowers and they do come in a variety of species. We wanna to think too about, you know, how accessible flowers that we plant are to different bee species. So bees have different tongue lengths. Um, bumblebees and honeybees have longer tongues and they can access these, this, these pink flowers that have long tubular structures to them. They can get their proboscis down there and access nectar. But some short tongue bees like those sweat bees or those um, andrenid bees um, that emerge in early spring might need a, a, a floral, a flower like an aster, a more open face flower because they have shorter tongues and aren't able to access the nectar within those long tubular uh, flowers. So you might wanna think about just planting a variety of uh, plants that have different floral shapes. Next slide, please. We also wanna keep in mind too, when it comes to wild bees that there are generalist feeders and specialist feeders. So generalists are bees like bumblebees and honeybees, bees that will go to any number of floral blossoms to feed. Um, but then we have specialist bees. These are bees that might just feed from one or two specific floral species. So we see here in this chart B, we have the pink eyed bee that can eat from five of those flowers, the green eyed one from four, the yellow eyed one from two, and then we have the super specialist bee off to the right, the blue eyed one with the blue wings that might only forage from one flower. So um, next slide, please. Uh, we'll explain a little bit more. There's a fellow, a researcher that does um, uh, specialist bee work up in the Northeast. And he's looked at a lot of specialist bees at bees in our region and has found that there are about 57 bee species that visit only a few plant genera and that 32 native plant genera host specialist bees. And these are plants like asters, violets, willows, blueberries, and goldenrods that are uh, more of uh, host plants for those specialist bees. So just something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So when planting your garden, and it could be a small patch, like a three foot by three foot patch or a pot filled with flowers. But if you have more space, you wanna think like a pollinator with different uh, shapes, flowers, different colored flowers. Bees don't see red. So having blue or yellow or white flowers um, is very helpful to plant. Bigger clumps, if you can manage that, um, that are clustered together that are blooming uh, throughout the season from early spring into late fall, leaving downed stumps and logs and clusters of cut pruned branches there. You can see up front, there's a little clump of branches that are put in there and leaving some bare areas and softer mulch. These are all terrific uh, places for bees to nest within and for bees to forage from. Something like this would be, is, is a terrific planting plot for bees. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, lawns aren't that helpful to bees. We have a lot of lawn. It's the number one cultivated crop in this nation. Um, there's really nothing up top. And if there is, there's clover and dandelions, but we tend to cut it uh, each week or every two weeks or however often we mow. And there really isn't anything there, right? The lawns are useful, but the question is, do we need so much of it? We might want to think, rethink lawns. Next slide, please. So if we're rethinking lawns, um, not only for ourselves, but I also teach assist for a course in pollinators. And we had an interesting discussion last semester about lawns and whether the students in that class wanted to mow lawns. And they really had no interest. This is just anecdotal, but they had no interest in mowing lawns <laughs> in the future. Who knows, maybe they will, maybe they won't, but they're really looking for alternatives. They don't want to be bogged down in all that mowing. So maybe they will, and maybe we will think about some alternatives. 
There's some beautiful books out there that give um, ground cover alternatives. This one on the right, Beautiful No Mow, Mow Yards is one, but they're very attractive and there isn't anything for us to really do with them week to week. Um, the maintenance is a lot lower, the fossil fuel use is lower. It's just something for us to think about. And there's a lot more there for bees. Next slide, please. This is a campaign that began in the UK, the No Mo May campaign, which is taken up by Bee City USA, which uh, connects with college campuses and cities around the United States to try to increase pollinator plantings um, with part, in partnership with the Zerse Society. So No Mo May is a particular important month um, where they encourage folks, homeowners, not to mow their uh, yards for the month of May. And why May? Because we have clover, we have dandelions growing. And this is the month when a lot of solitary ground nesting bee species are emerging and those females are gathering pollen to provision their nests. So just something for us to think about. Mowing more infrequently, maybe if we have a patch of dandelions or clover, we mow around it and we make a little island uh, and leave it there until it, uh, the, the blossoms die off. But this is a popular um, campaign that appears to be gaining ground, particularly in the Minnesota area and hopefully other states as well. Next slide, please. So if we don't um, not cut in May or we are thinking about meadows or we're thinking about doing something else, maybe we just think about letting part of our lawn grow longer. This is my back. Uh, yard area, I have a lot of grass and I do not like cutting all this grass. So I frame around it. You can see where I framed around it. It's kind of a big uh, circle. I intend to put this, uh, convert this long grass area into a wildflower meadow this coming year, um, along with some other places on the property. But this is a really nice way to show you know, so it doesn't look so messy and perhaps neglected, that this is intentional. I'm still mowing around it. I'm leaving this long. Lots of insects, insects take cover in there. It's a great way to go if you can manage that. Next slide, please. So the upshot is that bees, uh, wild bees need floral diversity and they need connectivity, whether it's in an urban setting where these plantings can be done on roofs or agricultural settings where wildflowers are put next to adjoining cropland um, or anything in between in those suburban settings as well. Next slide, please. So I know this is a woodland group. And so I was thinking about, well, what about bees in woodland areas? Is there anything, is there much on this? Uh, next slide, please. And there are bees in woodland areas. We, there just isn't a lot of research about bees in woodland areas, uh, but this is one study that I pulled from last year, and this is an article associated with particular studies that was entitled, Spring Forest Bees Get Their Due. They're there, but we just don't hear too much about them, and there isn't that much, much research on, there, on them. In this particular study, which was carried out by Rutgers in New Jersey, they looked at um, over five seasons sites, woodland sites in New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania, and were able to identify over three dozen forest dwelling species. They also looked at hit some historical data from the late 1800s on up to the present, and were able to determine that um, these forest dwelling species, and this is one of the most common ones that they found, this Osmia pumilla that, that is featured here, that these over three dozen forest dwelling species tend to stay within the forests. They aren't you know, coming in from the outer parts. So I thought that part was very interesting. But I think just as we've heard more about native bees and wild bees in the last five, six, seven, eight years, um, in the research world with wild bees, we'll be hearing more about bees in forests. And that's a, a really exciting development. Next slide, please. So I wanted to thank um, everyone for um, being here. And if you have any questions now, or if you wanted to email me a question, there's my email address there at the university. And I just wanted to point out um, a couple of resources that I really love. I love this Zerse Society book on the right, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. It's all right there. And um, it's, I think it's done according to color or season, if I'm remembering correctly, but some, it's a great resource. Zerse um, Society, which is a conservation organization for invertebrates, 
is a great website to check out. They have numerous publications on planting for pollinators and bees. Another site that I like is Ernst Conservation Seeds. That's where we uh, purchase the seed mix for all those meadow sites. They sell seed mixes. They also have a, a, a good number of publications about um, meadow plantings and particularly preparations and, and all of the seed mixes that they have. And then there are these three online free PDFs that you can access to. And the reason I love these so much is that the illustrations um, with Bee Basics and the native plant ones are really beautiful. People, researchers put a lot of time into making them look pretty and they're very thoughtfully written. Bee Basics is done by uh, Beatrice Moisett and Steve Buckman. Um, and that's an introduction to our native bees, a lot about wild bees and their needs. The Native Plants for Small Yard is a beautiful publication by Kate Brandis. And the thing I really like about this one is that there are uh, planting ideas in there. So they, she takes common areas that we all have in our yard, like maybe small yards or middle size yards, like around the mailbox, what can you plant around the mailbox or in this corner or um, toward the front, near the front door. So she has, there are numerous planting um, ideas there with the, the species and the number of species, um, all for pollinating insects and bees. And then lastly, this PDF poll planting for pollinators is guiding principles and design concepts for the residential pollinator habitat is also a very useful PDF. So they're all available on these uh, respective websites. Um, or if you just Google the name and the um, PDF, it'll pop on up. So um, with that, I just wanted to thank everybody and, um, and uh, I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. Wow, Lindsay, that was uh, so informative. Uh, I, ha I have several questions and I noticed in our chat, we have several questions. So um, as I get myself oriented with the chat, um, what I thought was really interesting was, uh, and I appreciate that you brought the forested stuff in there too. Um, and what was interesting about what you said is that they haven't been studied very much. So I wanna give a little forestry tip about um, four to five snag trees per acre is what's recommended, um, what, what, what's silviculturally recommended, four to five snag trees per acre. So um, with that, what do you think about bee houses? you know, the, the little tubes and bee houses, how, yeah. how much do you think they use those? Well, I think they do use them. The problem that I can um, glean from some of the research that I've read about them is that it, there, there's great potential for um, pathogen buildup in some of those tubes. So um, I think a couple things, if there are tubes that are used and particularly if there are some kind of liner that's put in sort of like a straw-like thing that they be changed or cleaned out every so often, that can be helpful. Also, just from what I've seen that's available in stores, I noticed that a lot of those tubular um, houses or bee hotels are not very deep. So um, they could be a lot deeper. You know, I have one that I bought from or somebody gave me maybe, and it's only about three or four inches deep. Well, birds are going to peck at the outer part. Um, and there really, you know, isn't much protection for that developing larva and pupa inside those tubes. So I'd say um, to read about them before you decide to, to use them. Bees will take up nests within them, but you want to make sure that you're doing things to help keep them clean and also that they're um, holes of varying sizes for uh, different bees. And um, also that the depth is, you know, I'd go like if you can drill that far into some kind of material or find a bee house that's this deep, you know, at least something that's eight inches, uh, eight inches of depth there. Great, that's some good tips. Uh, you know, I never really considered the depth of those bee houses and um, how susceptible they would be to birds. So eight inches, that's great. Yes, and some people even cover the outer part with, with a little bit of like chicken wire material, enough so that the bees can get out when they emerge, but um, tight enough that the bird, you know, isn't able to peck, peck at whatever the outer layer is. Okay. So that could be a useful um, yeah. material to use on the outer part too. Great. 
So I'm going through the chat here now, and I see that somebody asked if there was any Society of American Foresters continuing education credits for this. Uh, that would have been a great idea, but I apologize. No, I did not uh, go get Society of American Foresters credits for this, sorry. But thank you for that reminder that I should probably do that for the other ones, thank you. Uh, thank you, New York, for joining us. You know, I meant to ask in my introduction where everybody was from. So I was glad that some people put in the chat that they're from New York. Uh, I'm on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, and I think Lindsay said she's uh, in Central Maryland there. Um, I'm in North Baltimore County, close to Pennsylvania. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's nice to see see such a variety of people. Okay. So Lindsay, I don't know if you can see the chat also, but our, our question here is, are the common names of bees such as sweat and miner due to a particular activity that they have? It usually is, you know, so we as people have assigned them names based on the job that we perceive them to be doing. So you have the minor bees that are mining away, the mason bees that are dividing their cells with mud material, the polyester bees that are lining their cells with that cl clear material, the secretions. Um, yeah, so we, we tend to carpenter bees who are out there <laughs> making holes in wood. So we assign them these names based, based on the job that we perceive them to do. And then for the sweat bees, of course, they're hovering around us, licking um, sweat off of our bodies, aren't they? Wow, there we go. Salty treat for them. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so uh, what about the coloration? Like, is there any significance reason why one is metallic over uh, one not being quite as metallic? Either the question is, has any research done about coloration of bees? And is there a significance to that? There may very well be um, research done about the coloration of bees, but I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, I, I simply don't know. I'm, yeah, if somebody wants to follow up and email me about that, I'm happy to look at that because that's a very interesting question. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this next question uh, was what I was thinking too when we got onto the Meadow Talk. It was one of my questions here. Uh, how much prep work is required to develop these meadow planting sites? Well, um, there's a little bit of prep work and I will say I think it depends on what's been there before. So in, um, if it's like tightly growing cool season turf grass, you got to kill that off or remove it. Sometimes in these sites, we used a sod remover. Um, sometimes that didn't work so well with the type of grass that we were trying to remove. It worked very well with like tightly um, uh, grown root systems. Um, but then you have to take all of that sod somewhere and plunk it and it's very heavy. So uh, we wound up in our larger sites, um, putting down that geotech um, landscape, a uh, very thick plastic fabric in strips to make our shape. Sometimes it was a kidney shape. Sometimes it was more of an oval. Sometimes it was rectangular. Um, and we put that down for four or five months and that killed off the grass. We, we pegged it with very long landscaping um, staples. And then remove, we would put that, we would do that maybe in the, the spring. It would be there through the summer, kill off the grass, and then we'd seed in the fall. And then we just rough it up a little bit with a, a hand push cultivator. We didn't want to do deep tilling because that tends to bring up the weed, dormant weed seeds. Um, but I will say just anecdotally, anecdotally in the end, I think there was great success when we seeded in the fall. Um, and, and prepared the, the, of course, the season before, because these native wildflower seeds need a, uh, some cold uh, stratification. So they need to be in, within the ground. They need to get roughed up a bit. They need to have moisture um, in that freezing weather. And, and that I think just anecdotally, we did do a spring planting. Um, it just seemed like the fall plantings were quite successful. So there is some preparation uh, to do for sure. But I will say it just depends on, is it a small amount? Can you get it off with the sod cutter pretty easily? If it's a larger area, maybe you wanna kill it off with that landscape fabric. Um, once it's planted, 
Um, you know, you have to look out for the invasive weeds, get them out of there. But then the cutting regime is, is basically once a year. People do that in the fall. Uh, some do it in late winter, uh, depending on the site and the, the maintenance of the site and how that's going and who's responsible for it. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of extension offices will do some meadow uh, planting educational programs like Master Gardeners offer mm. some of those programs for people. And I went to one of them. And what was interesting, because uh, this leads into our next question that you started to talk about invasive plants. Um, what they had suggested was, you know, that seed mix that you have, you kind of plant that somewhere else on a tray so that you know that only those plants are going to come up so that you're able to identify what you want to keep in your meadow. And then yes. you can see that the, the invasives or the, un, the, the things that you don't necessarily think are going to be productive for your objectives, you, yes. can, you can remove those. So that, that was an interesting tip. And um, so with that, so if I do find invasives, this next question is, how do uh, you keep invasive plants out of a new meadow area? Well, um, and, and I want to answer that um, uh, first, but can I go back to that one, uh, that idea that you first mentioned, which is uh, identifying these little seedlings can be very diff difficult. So Agnes, you raise a really great method, which is to set aside and plant somewhere. It could be in a pot, it could be in another area. The seed mix so you can tell what the difference between an emerging uh, wildflower seedling and a weed. Um, but I will say the Ernst Conservation Seed website has a lot of pictures of some of these um, seedlings and what they look like. So that was a big help to me when we were getting started. I had access to a lot of those pictures and also having put in a separate area what Agnes mentioned, which is to, to, put, to um, plant them in a separate area so you know what's what. And then what helped with all of this is just plant, using the same seed mix over and over again. What we saw in one meadow was what we were seeing in another meadow, so that helped too. But in terms of keeping down the invasives, it's been managed in different places depending on the site. So with the solar site, it's a big acre that's managed by the uh, farmer up there who is in Frederick County and who cuts that primarily. And um, they, that's now handled by the solar company. I'm not sure. I think it's mostly the annual cutting. I'm not sure how some of the other invasives are being handled at, at this very moment. I will say with the smaller sites, like the new Carrollton City Hall site, um, they're in there and they have uh, a landscape crew that's employed by the city and they're able to weed out those invasives. They know their plants pretty well. For some of the homeowners, um, we work with them to give them um, some of the photographs that we had of the seedlings so they knew. And we were just out there using some of those um, plant apps lots of the times where we were taking photographs. What's this weed? This doesn't look familiar. You know, sort of doing it that way. Um, but then as in, as particularly with the University Park group, they become became very knowledgeable about the weeds that were in that area. So the weeds tended to differ. I have a lot of stilt grass up here in Canada thistle, but I wasn't seeing that a lot in some of these other areas. So um, it's just about learning as you go, consulting books, using these uh, apps on your phone, snapping pictures, and also some of the sites had other groups that were uh, knowledgeable about plants, but particularly that volunteer group with University Park, they've really educated themselves about things and have learned how to handle and manage that meadow now. So that's been really nice to see, but there is a little bit of a learning curve, and I think that's just natural. And some elbow grease until, yeah. mm -hmm. until kind of the guard, until <laughs> and determination the to get that yeah. out, get those yeah. weeds out. Yeah. And, and then once pulled, we, what we did was we didn't want to leave a lot of bare ground for more weeds to come in. So especially with the University Park group, we would um, sprinkle some more of the seed mix in. Um, and then people just came in and sprinkled other things that they had. If they were saving butterfly milkweed seed, they would come and sprinkle that in. Um, Sometimes they uh, bring in mature plants or plugs, you know, the, um, the starter growth plants to the sort of seedling forms of those native plants and put some of those in. So it varied. Well, you, you gave me a good opportunity for a segue here. I got um, a message from 
a woodland owner, Rick A, Rick and Kathy A Band. They're here on the Eastern Shore, and they do lots of great work on their property. They um, do some great civil culture on their property. They do some great um, meadow work. They make habitat for wildlife. They have great ponds on their property. Um, if there's ever an event at the A Bands, um, you're going to want to go. Uh, but what they let me know was that they have some button bush plants that they're willing to share. And um, uh, in the chat, you can see I put their contact information that if anybody would like button bush plants, um, they have several uh, along one of their ponds that they're willing to share. So if you have some of those gaps that Lindsay was mentioning, um, and you want to ride out to the Eastern shore to go to maybe Old Salties for lunch, check out the Harriet Tubman Museum while you're there down there getting to that button bush. Um, the A bands are great. It's a, it's a, it's a great, um, great spot. So um, thank you, Rick and Kathy for offering such a great, a, a great opportunity for people. We thank you for that. Um, okay, so going, there was another question about the removal. Somebody questioned, uh, what about prescribed burning for meadows to keep some of the weeds down? Any thoughts on, have you thought about that or? Well, um, we haven't particularly thought about that with our sites. I am aware there was around the time that the pandemic started a site that I wanted to go to at Pearlstone up here in Baltimore County where they were doing a prescribed burn just so I could see the way it worked. But um, you know, it takes a lot of care and you have to have, you know, firefighters there, um, I would imagine. And I've learned a little bit about that, that in its use from larger gardens and speaking with some folks that are associated with those gardens, like Longwood Gardens, for instance, they've done prescribed burns. There seems to be great value in doing that. I, I think there's a, a, a lot of um, safety measures. We didn't try it in any of our sites. Um, one of the sites, the University Park, um, they tend to, um, I think the management strategy going forward is they're going to take a segment, a large segment of it, um, and completely tamp it out using that landscape fabric, not the prescribed burn, and reseed it at certain points in the future to keep that meadow going. So I think that's the idea behind it. Um, but I do not have any personal experience with prescribed burns, but I, I hear it can be valuable. Right. Uh, so there was a question here. You showed a graphic of the uh, Ram Ramso bee. Am I saying that right? Ramos bee. Uh, bee tunnels. The bee tunnels. How many branches with it had many branches with many larvae? How many would an average bee be able to take care of? Oh, I think that, I don't know that answer because I think it's very species dependent. Um, some bee species may just make one tunnel with a couple of chambers off to the side for, you know, three, four, five. I think, you know, on average, it's about six, seven, eight, you know, uh, larvae that are laid within there. But I think that varies greatly depending on species, both in terms of the amount of eggs laid and the um, configuration and architecture of the nest itself. Uh, we had some platitudes uh, throughout these chats of a great presentation and stuff, Lindsay, just don't want to get that lost in there. Um, so there's a question here, and this was on my list too. Uh, what types of mulch would be better? Leaf mold? Uh, um, what about pine, pine beds, L like leaf pine needles, long leaf pine is what they said. But. Yeah, um, well, I guess too, some of it would depend on the soil needs too, like the acidity aspect of soils as well. I'm guessing, you know, pine seems very soft. Um, I, I can't speak to the soil part of it. Um, that's not my area, but, um, you know, sort of mowed over leaf uh, litter, uh, leaf mulch can be useful, just something that's softer, uh, something that a bee could penetrate in lieu of the hardwood, you know, big chunky mulch. Okay, yeah, that was one of my questions too. So if we're not gonna use, because people like how pretty that looks. So what would yeah. be a, an equivalent to that, to, to give that charm that the homeowner is looking for? Um, yes, and, that's, and that takes us to sort of this, the way that we plant too, right? So we tend to have mulched beds 
within the plant, like the mature plants that we're putting in there. These wildflower areas that I've been speaking about are really different, a different type of ground cover in that these, whether they're done from seeds or whether it's a combination of seeds and plugs or mature native plants clustered here and there, it's a denser way of planting so that you're not needing that sort of mulch to be in between each of the plants to deter the weeds. There, it's just so dense that, you know, you hopefully are getting to a point where the weeds just don't have a chance to even get in there. So it's a different type of ground cover um, completely. Right. Uh, we have a tip here. Somebody says uh, homegrownnaturalparks.org is that there's, uh, that, that can help with the potential areas in your yard to plant natives. So we're hearing in the chat that people are doing, people are doing this, you know, hopefully people are getting some good tips and I appreciate that people are sharing their tips on there. That's wonderful. So uh, could we get a list of the native flowers that you have planted and the maintenance required? Uh, is that, is, is it just mow once and weed? Is, is that something you gave yeah. us at the end there? Um, well, you can find a lot of these, um, that information in the resources and particularly Ernst Seed. If you go to the Ernst Seed website, the particular seed mix that we use for all planting sites is called the Northeast Showy Pollinator Mix. And that has about 26 different species of native wildflowers. Um, and also uh, we planted, we um, also mixed in there some little blue stem warm season bunch grasses uh, within that seed mix. So that's what we used for every single plot um, that we planted in these eight sites. As far as the maintenance, it's really varied depending, like I mentioned about the, you know, the workforce and the labor that's available, whether it's a, you know, like a university um, park situation with volunteers or whether it's New Carrollton with a staff that can do it or a farmer up at the solar site or an individual homeowner. So it really varies, but I'd say, you know, the first few years you're really out there, you're looking for the invasive weeds that are coming up, trying to identify them, whether it's by a website like Ernst that gives you the seedling pictures or trying to compare them to the little site that you've set aside that Agnes mentioned earlier. Um, or, you know, looking at a weed, little weed handbook or a weed app on your phone, trying to get those weeds out, maybe sprinkling a little seed in there or just putting a full mature plant in that spot where you've taken out the weeds so that there's something there growing to hold the soil. Um, but eventually after, you know, looking out there and trying to get those invasives out, uh, you're doing that work of removing the invasives. And then the cutting is basically once a year. Many of the sites have gotten into the um, maybe early September timeframe. Some of the sites want to leave a lot of those, um, that plant material as refuge areas and, and cut it later in the winter um, before new growth emerges in the spring. So that it was the Northeast seed mix from uh, Earth? Yeah, it's called Northeast Showy Pollinator Mix, and it's pretty expensive. Um, it's, but it, I think it's well worth it. They also sell one with grasses in, in it, and it's a cheaper version, but it has a lot more grass and fewer blossoms. But you'll see that they, Ernst has seed mixes for every conceivable soil type um, uh, out there and, and uh, geographic area out there. So. They're locally adapted. They source from seeds that are grown in our area um, from growers. So they're going to be native wildflowers that grow well here or wherever you may be. And uh, I want to give a little tip. The Seek, S-E-E-K app uh, from iNaturalist, S-E-E-K is an app that helps identify plants. I like it. It's yeah. very handy super easy to use if you're not into apps and but you have your phone with you and you're walking around and you're like hey what was that yeah um you it's very simple to use and and you know if you knew me well you, you you'd know that it was simple <laughs> <laughs> so uh, i just want to help out with that uh, identifying stuff 
So we got a suggestion here, um, host plants of, so somebody's giving, I like it that we're sharing our knowledge here, y'all. Thank yes. you for sharing some lists of stuff. So here it is. Is it worth it to uh, supplement hard pack rocky clay areas with sand to create a nesting area? If so, what kind of sand, fine white playground sand or yellow construction sand? Hmm. I feel like this is out of my area to speak about. And I'm. this is bringing up memories of a soil and fertilizer course I took way back when, where I think I learned it's very hard to change the texture of, of soil just by adding a different type of component like uh, sand. But what I would say is if it were me, I know I have had little sand piles out there around my shed here and there. I did use the white playground sand. I haven't seen much observationally in terms of bees using it, but I would experiment a bit. Just get some sand, mix it in with the soil and see what happens. I don't know if there's, there tends to be research that um, talks about sandy soil being conducive to bee nesting, but then there are other soils that bees will also nest within too. So I don't think that there are any, you know, um, uh, perfect answers to this and it remains to be researched in, in many areas, but I would say, go ahead and experiment and see what happens. And the next comment was asking if the meadow seed collection uh, was available for sale for this fellow's meadow. Yes, and it was at Ernst. Yes, was Ernst was Conservation Seed. If you just Google that, their website will pop up and you'll see all types of seed mixes um, for different um, areas of the country. Okay, so this is an interesting one here and I'm, uh, you know, I live on the shore. So this is, okay. So it's been, I'd have space to plant along our driveway but it is next to a crop field that gets sprayed. Mm. What can I do there? Mm. Um, I would look at some materials, you know, pesticides are, are not really my area, but I know that in looking at some of the materials that Xerces has, also in conjunction with um, the USDA, um, and um, I want to say the Natural Resource Conservation uh, Group that's associated with USDA and Xerces, they have a lot of material on their website. Um, in the farming for pollinators area. Oh, and if you were just to put in Xerces and then look at their publications on farming for pollinators, they set out some planting principles that um, are often, often involve, you know, buffer plants between agricultural areas and residential areas, uh, what those types of plants are. Um, I would be concerned if there isn't the ability to put in some kind of buffer, but you might need some kind of like non-pollinator, you know, screening type buffer uh, to help in, in this scenario. But that um, website will give you some great ideas at Xerces and then farming for pollinators. They'll have some information on protecting pollinators from pesticides. And Xerce was the word that started with X. With X, yes. It's yeah. the um, conservation... Uh, it's X-E-R-C-E-S. It's a conservation group for invertebrates. So I add you... something that as yeah. well? It's Taylor. Um, they can also register their hive on BeeWatch. So any commercial applicators um, kind of required to check that map and be cautious, cautious of any of those boxes nearby of an agricultural field. Yes. So yeah. I can find a link for, for the, the honeybee. Yes, the honeybee watch. Yes, that's a okay. terrific Maybe suggestion. Watch. Right. I also wanted to put a plug in there for Emily Zobel. She is an entomologist out of Dorchester Extension Office. Um, Emily Zobel, yeah, Z-O-B-E-L, Emily, uh, out of the Dorchester Extension Office. She's an entomologist. And actually she's doing some research on uh, what Lindsay was talking about, about planting along um, farm fields. Mm. So she may have uh, this person who asked about the neighbor uh, or about uh, having the field beside them. Emily Zobel, if, if, if you forget that, my name is Agnes, contact me and um, I, will, I can let you know, um, get, give you Emily's contact. 
Okay, so there was a question here about the no mow yards slide. Do you remember that slide that you have that says no mow? Sure, yards? no mow may. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. it's asking what is the very large growing plant in the top top left corner? I don't know if. Um, well, I think there were just a couple plants. There was the dandelion, of course, the big yellow one. Uh, we think of that as a weed, but bees will go to it and feed from it. Um, and that's on many lawns. Um, and the other was uh, white Dutch clover, also um, very dominant in lawns. And bees will use that too. So those are the two images on that slide, in addition to just the Nomo May, um, I think it was a Bee City USA uh, uh, image. Okay. And, you know, good, good segue because the question is, is leaving clover in the lawn a good practice? And what types of clover? Um, well, my experience has been leaving the, the white Dutch clover. That's what I don't seed for that. That just naturally comes up. It tends to come up when there's been a lot of rainfall. So my practice is to either not mow it or mow around it. If I see a patch, it usually will grow in patches. So I have these little clover islands that I'll mow around. I have um, entirely seeded large areas with crimson clover. That's a really beautiful clover, uh, deep red crimson color. Um, again, maybe, you know, the bees will still go to it, even though you do read that they don't see the color red, but, but they tend to go to it um, as will other insects. So that's another beautiful clover. But Xerces would probably have some information on clover types too. As, as would um, earned seed, I believe they provide clover seeds too. When does one cut the stems? Remember you, uh, you encouraged us to leave one inches on the stem. So the, the question here is when does one cut the stems? I tend to start the process in fall and then leave the stems until uh, all the native bees have uh, they closed. But I would, but it would, but it would be good to know when the bees emerge. Uh, yeah. So, so that cutting was that one was a one foot. So the suggestion was leaving about a foot from the base of the plant upward. Oh, sorry, sorry. Right, um, sorry. And, and a lot of that applies to some of these pithy hollow stems. So I would just go around and maybe if the practice is to prune in the fall and wanna get rid of some things, I tend to leave pretty much everything until late winter and then I deal with it before spring. Um, and that just provides coverage for not only insects and, and, you know, whatever might be in those stems, but also birds and so forth and other animals. But if you want to get to it in the fall, maybe go ahead and, and prune those plants that aren't, aren't necessarily hollow. Um, you can pretty well see that when, as you're going out and pruning. If you have hollow ones, maybe leave them for a little longer. And I would say it's a foot from the base of the stem. And then you can just take all those cuttings at whatever point you decide to prune and cl clump them all together like in a little clump and then set them on the side of the property until they're likely to emerge. And I will say that would probably be, it, it could be anything. We don't know what's in there necessarily, but if there is something that's emerging, it would probably do so by May into June. Okay, so that was part of that question, May. Or is it de, de, is it degree dependent? And uh, you know, if she if it was degree dependent, then she could find that out online. What degree days? Yeah, is. yeah. So you know, when it's usually you know the consistent fifty five degree uh, soil temperature in that area when uh, flowers are blooming, you know, it's very species dependent in terms of what could be in there. So you just want to take more of a universal approach, I guess. May, June. Okay. 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 Uh, the next question, can we get a tree list of good trees for bees? So uh, I was looking to see if I had within hands reach Doug Talame from University of Delaware. Doug Talame um, has a book and it's Bring Nature Home or is, you yes. know, somebody, some, is that what it's called? Bringing nature home, yes. Bringing nature. So I know he talks a lot about the connection between insects and bee, or insects and trees, and yes. uh, you know butterflies and stuff. And you know, one of his uh, big things is the oak tree. Yes. So uh, you know, just for insects in general, that's a good start. Doug Talame has some good stuff. Very popular guy. Um, what other suggestions are there? You think? 
good tree well, free list on good trees for bees. Um, I know that Zerse's book that I recommended has a lot of perennial plants and maybe shrubs. I'm thinking they could have some trees too. I, I don't have a lot of good tree bee books. There, I think there needs to be more tree bee books. <laughs> so I would try just Googling that and see what would come up because I, I honestly do not have a bee tree book that's exclusively trees. Wow. It there might sounds... be a smattering of them, but like like one of the slides mentioned for the specialist bees, they're early spring um, blooming trees like willows and maples that bees will forage on. But um, I'm not really sure if I know of a resource that um, just on the tip of my tongue that's more focused on bee forage. Yeah. I would Google that. And, and I would think too that Xerces would have something on that as well. Um, yeah. As with Doug Talame too, yeah, his book, he's his books, and he has more than that. Bringing nature home are really focused on trees and um, you know replacing lawn and the um, habitat um, uh, for insects like uh, you know moth and butterfly larvae feeding the birds. Really important. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like, you know, it sounds like a collaboration, Lindsay. You do the bees, I do the trees. We can we can make a fact sheet for what, <laughs> we need, we need for a bee that. tree book. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree. I love it. <laughs> and that person that asked the question, hey, if you did any preliminary investigation on it, hey. <laughs> okay, so here we go. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and amp it up. So uh, do many of this was a great question. Do many of the bees sting as a matter of defense? We didn't even talk about uh, right. you know. Uh, did, did many of the do many of the bees sting as a matter of defense? Are they are they are there any major predators? So what is, I think it was interesting about this question is that we didn't even talk, talk about this. We're encouraging bees to be around our home, but yes, uh, what about the stinging? Of, yes, so the stinging aspect is really more of a problem with a larger social colony, like a honeybee colony. That's why the beekeepers wear those suits and the veils. They're going to protect the colony, um, and they have pheromones that send out alarms to their hive mates to to um, if they're uh, roughly dealt with or they're defending their colony. You know, wasps, of course, the yellow jackets will defend a colony, but with solitary bees, these are typically, uh, you know, individual females provisioning a nest, going about their business. Some of them with abdomens and stingers so small they really can't mm. penetrate or if they do it's more like a little teeny weeny you know like almost like a bite like what you'd feel with a sweat bee it's very minor they just don't have the capacity to sting humans in the way that bees from larger colonies like honeybees would um, although they can defend themselves certainly against other insects with their stingers um, just not human beings so yeah, that's an important aspect. So many of these bees are, are not really out to sting or have the capability to sting humans. They're just so small. Okay. Yeah. So then I was thinking about the anaphylactic, uh, you know, shock that people might go in. Would it be minimized, do you think? I guess maybe I'm going mm -hmm. on to, off to a different... It's hard to say about that. You know, I dealt with honeybees and was stung thousands of times. Then yeah. last summer developed an anaphylactic shock after one sting. Wow. Now I carry with me outside all the time the um, the EpiPen. So, um, but I've never had a problem with the a solitary bee stinging me. Okay. Um, it's okay. always been just honeybees. Hmm. Not as sweet as we thought, I guess. I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there, there's drawbacks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this was this. You know, we kind of talked about this, but we could recap uh, just very quickly. Uh, do any native do any native tr small trees and shrubs assist bees? So I do want to say that I put that link in. If you want some button bush, uh, there is some that the A bands are generously able to help you out with. And that email, if you want to contact them, is in the link. But uh, any lists off the top of your head of shrubs and trees? Um, I shrubs I think are included in that Zerse's book, a hundred uh, uh, plants to feed the bees, in addition to many perennials. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not the greatest when it comes to plants and certainly not trees, just willows and maples are, the, are those that are coming to mind. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I've observed just myself more shrubs that don't have bees on them than those that do. Um, you know, I, I don't really see bees on hydrangeas. <laughs> 
I don't know if they ever go to hydrangeas. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't answer that. I, I don't know uh, the plant material that well to be able to speak to that, but I am sure there's a site online that can give any number of resources in terms of plant material, both shrubs and trees, about what's most attractive to bees. And Xerces comes uh, to mind first and okay. foremost. So I'm noticing the time, it's 1.30. We have several, several questions left. And um, let's kind of, we're just gonna pick it up a little bit, eh, Lindsay? We got oh, this. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you if we have lost some some people, but um we appreciate you joining us. So the one question is keeping the deer off their native plants. This is a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, there are resources out there. Uh, somebody said a fence in uh, putting a fence up. I ha I know somebody who puts um, ivory soap, hangs ivory soap on her uh, grapevines and she swears by it. This is what she's been doing for years and years and years. So, um, this, Lindsay, if you want to touch on that a little bit, but this, we could talk about this for another hour, this, this particular thing. So University of Maryland uh, extension, uh, Jonathan Kays on our end of things, he's out of the Western Maryland Research and Education Center. He has knows, uh, he does ex extensive, he's done extensive research on um, deterring deer. So on our Maryland Woodland Stewards Education website, um, there should be a section of deer management and Jonathan Kay's contact information. If you want to kind of spitball ideas with him and see um, what kind of options would be out there. But Lindsay, what, what, what kind of options do you have just quick? Um, I can't tell you about the deer, Agnes. I'm so sorry. No, that's I don't, fine. I don't know much about them other than, you know, I have a lot of them in my yard myself. Um, I will say, and this is anecdotal, they don't, I have various meadow strips out amongst that long growing grass. Those deer don't seem to really bother that area. They don't seem to be eating it. They seem to prefer other grass, but that's not the case for everybody. Um, so I think the ex reaching out to your local extension agent would be the, the best thing to do. Right. Also, I'm noticing that Raymond has written in the chat box a little information about shrubs and trees, uh, referencing Extension Master Gardener Facebook. Um, so that's toward the, the bottom of it. Right. So that's Good. a helpful link to have too, if folks want to take a look at that. There, the, uh, there's another one at the 1255 stamp time. There's another one there. Uh, great publication, Shrubs and Trees for Pollinators. That's exactly what this is going to, this yes. is the answer. This is the answer to the question that was asked. And can you remind everybody of that meadow flower seed mix once again? Sure. It's the Northeast Showy Pollinator Mix. And it's the type without the grasses. There's an, a more expensive type just with the wildflower seeds. And then there's the less expensive, expensive type with many um, grass seeds in it too, right. um, you know, depending on budgets and, and all right. of that. But I'm right. looking at the chats and there are lots of uh, good information, native plants and Hess has mentioned, oh, hi Hess, uh, hydrangeas, native hydrangeas attract lots of bumblebees. So there's, if, People want to peruse that too. Lots of good info in the chat I agree. box. Yeah. I agree. Um, and there on our website, there are there are videos. Even somebody's encouraging getting an electric fence, wrapping things uh, in aluminum foil, um, and Japanese stilt grass. These invasives, yes, are a challenge for everybody. That Japanese stilt yes. grass will drive you nuts, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and again, uh, that, that's a whole, we got, uh, if we had, you know, more time, we definitely want to go, go into the weeds with that. Hey, <laughs> but, um, uh, yes, you know, that I, IPM, that, 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 uh, invasive, invasive IPM, what is that? Integrated pest, Integrated management. pest management. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, how much elbow grease do you want to put in? Right. Um, Oh, look at some people are telling us where they're from. Frederick, Charles County, Rockville, Washington. Hi, you guys. Oh, oh great. We got Pennsylvania in there. Oh, great. Um, sorry, we missed miss some things. Great presentation. Uh, what is the value to the environment of bees? Oh, my gosh. Um, well, the social managed bees, uh, this is an, an environmental, and there's some downsides, of course, have to do with a lot of our agricultural 
food production, uh, fruits and vegetables, but all of the bees, there's 20,000 worldwide, are the pollinators of our native plants. So anything flowering out there, they're the bees that are helping those plants reproduce. So great ecological value. Okay, and then there's, uh, the, I guess the button bush is great for wet areas, y'all. Okay, so this one, any truth and could the temperatures be harmful to insects? I've heard that solar farms could be too hot and harmful for birds. Any truth to that? Uh, are the temperatures harmful to insects? Well, I know there's some research out having to do with climate change impacts on insects in general and concerns about that um, in a broad way. I don't know about the research, if any, that's been conducted on solar facilities and heat specifically with bees. I, I cannot answer that question. I'm just not aware if there, there is research on that. Well, but it's know, a great question to ask. I agree. This is where we get citizen scientists, you know, work with your extension agent to see, it, you know, let them know, well, at least on my end, um, with forestry stuff. Um, I do. I do like trying to support volunteers. Okay. So do, do I like this one. Does mother nature mow annually too? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So somebody's saying that that picture app were good, uh, very informative. What's your favorite app for weed ID? So I said the Seek app, S-E-E-K -E -E by iNaturalist. Any other apps that you have? Well, I've tried in addition to Seek, which I do like Plant Snap, but I often find that Plant Snap isn't very accurate. I don't know why that is. And then sometimes I have to give up entirely because I don't have um, very good internet or c connection. So the app isn't working well. <laughs> so, um, but Seek is a great one to try. And, and I, I also have a little booklet that I carry um, okay. with me in the field. And Seek too, you can take the picture and figure it out later. So yeah. somebody here said uh, great photos of native bees and honeybees. Somebody gave us a link there for photos. Uh, there's the link, uh, there's the email address for the button bush. Uh, we got some thank yous, thank yous. I'm going for the no mo May this year. Bail me out of my town, if my town arrests me. <laughs> <laughs> no mo, this is going to be, you, you know, we're going to see them in sh uh, chaining themselves to their, yeah, their and I, native meadows. I do think I saw in the, um, a chat box too, reference to Maryland legislation right there. Um, mm -hmm. over a situation that involved, you know, an, a more naturalized lawn and that homeowners association. So I think um, there are uh, fewer restrictions as a result of that case, you know, that people are free to plant what they like for pollinators. It was a very naturalized yard, if I'm recalling properly. Um, and HOAs, somebody's saying about HOAs and how those can be deterrents and, you know, uh, yes. impacts that whole fragmentation. So fine white sand as construction sand is sharp. Somebody was saying, gave a comment about the sand. So the mm. white, fine white sand is not as sharp. Mm. Um, and then there's that link that Taylor mentioned about the bee check. Uh, my vote is late winter. You'd be amazed how many birds use the bush for cover as well as eat the seeds during the winter. Oh, yes. I meant that when it cut back, that, that, that came up when we were talking about the cut back. Yes, and I noticed that in my oh. meadow areas here, a lot of birds eating the seeds from the dried up plant material, so. So somebody was saying that uh, that clover on your lawn uh, may mean that your soil is maybe acidic. So you might wanna check your pH and see if, if they're right. Hmm. Um, if you have to mow the clover, mow as high as possible. That's, that's how we maintain our food, food plot says that it says the A bands, you know, that have the button bush there. Yes. There was also another mention, where do you find a mower that can adjust to at least eight inches high? And believe me, I've thought about this with the equipment, the dearth of equipment that's there. If you want to mow differently, or if you want to mow a meadow as compared to turf grass, they just, you know, for safety reasons, they don't want feet slipping underneath them. So they're not going to have them high up in the air. And I could find no mower that was, you know, a high push mower that would give that um, much space. So it's, it, it, you have to do a little bit of searching. I think there is a company I can't remember the name of it, but there's something online I did see that seemed to be 
a little bit more adjustable for those higher levels of growth. But it, the equipment just isn't there for in large part. So sometimes it's taking a weed whacker to it, uh, something you have control of, if, especially if it's a smaller area where you're not using a machine that has a lower cut set. Right. And I'm seeing in the chat too that master gardeners do a pollinator friendly garden certification. So those, those master gardeners will be able to help educate you on how to make how uh, to receive that certification and help you along the way to do that too. So that's great. Live hydrangeas attract lots of bumbles, probably others hard to get the plant, hard to get the plant hydrangea. Irish spring soap on a rope. Somebody was saying Ooh. Irish spring, how I said I uh, ivory. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, what works for you, you know, uh, can you, you can really uh, informative PDF there. Okay. From the Fish and Wildlife Services alphabetized list of native plants and, uh, and shrubs. Um, oh yeah, that's a good one. I have that somewhere here too, but I don't know if it goes into specific bee, like this bee will like this because of the shorter flower. I, I don't know if the list of native plant nurseries for Maryland Native Plant Society. This chat is full of great links, y'all. So I hope yes. you are, 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 are checking that out. So I really like, okay, so there's another nursery suggestion in Virginia. Oh, that picture did not, oh, the picture app. Yeah. Yes. Someone mentioned Earth Sangha. I've heard of that as well. That's, uh, yeah, very good. Lots of good resources in the chat box. Yes, you Great. guys. I appreciate that. Uh, Lindsay, I appreciate you too. We had a great oh. conversation there. Uh, maybe so I'm happy to be here with you. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> Lindsay, it's great. You know, um, I, I got onto a bug kick uh, last year, insect kick uh, last, well, maybe not last year, but the year before that. And uh, I'm rolling with it. I like, I like this. I wish I could just do a whole series on insects. So uh, very valuable. I appreciate your time, Lindsay, and keep us posted on you know, the things that you're doing, we're all so curious about what you're doing. Oh, I sure will. And, and let's keep in mind that bee tree book. <laughs> there yes. needs to be more of those. I like that. I like Thank that. You, Agnes. At least a fact sheet. <laughs> yes, a fact sheet. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Take care. Happy New Year, everybody. We'll see you next month for the Threatened and Endangered Species uh, webinar. It's going to be great. She's a good, Cherry's a great presenter, uh, too. So, uh, See y'all next month. Happy New Year.